God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I am praying for your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The first reading from this 18th Sunday after Pentecost is from the prophet Isaiah, the 25th chapter. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of merit, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast on all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. The second reading is from St. Paul's Epistle to the Philippians, the fourth chapter. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to be about. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
frightens. It kills. Or at least it should. Because God's preaching of the law through his word, even when it comes in the gospel lesson, still shows us our sins. The law condemns. Again, even in the gospel reading this morning, we hear with this surprise ending some frightening words. Jesus said, but when the king came to look at the guests, he saw there was a man with no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? The man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Where did that come from? Could Jesus be serious? Could the king, our loving God, who chooses to dine with sinners, who invites us to this place, really be so cruel as to condemn some to outer darkness? It certainly sounds like it. So let me ask you, do these words of our Lord make you take note and ask yourself, could that be me? they make you wonder, how can I be certain that God isn't going to do this to me? Because truth be told, these words frighten me. Don't be deceived. In the gospel, there are heavy words of law. I don't mean in the gospel in the narrow sense of the Christ, preaching of Christ and the crucified, but in the gospels themselves. Here the gospel. And those words are there to warn us, even we who are of the household of faith. Remember, the Jews had taken for granted their status as God's people. They rejected the words of the prophets, even killed them for it. As we heard last week, they were even going to kill God's son. And they did. And why? Because he had come calling them to repentance. That made them uncomfortable. He had preached the law to them, telling them to turn from their wicked ways and back to him. And that frightened them. And then he offered himself for the forgiveness of not only their sins, but the sins of the whole world. And they didn't want to hear that either. So yes, these words of the Lord should get our attention too. Not everyone is going to be saved. So now let me ask you a slightly different question. How do you know that you're one of the few? That you will not be judged, <coughs> but that you are one of those who have been called, chosen by the Lord? How can you be sure of your place at the heavenly wedding banquet and feast for his son that goes on for all eternity? In other words, where do you find your assurance for your salvation? Of course, you know the answer. You've heard it playing from this pulpit many times. Not in yourselves. Human reason, aided by the temptations of the devil, expects that we should have to do something to contribute towards our own salvation. That God chooses us because we're so good, or how we'll respond to the gospel. Yet according to this parable of the kingdom, and the banquet and the wedding feast of the Lord, he has both the good and the bad in attendance. All who are there are there because they have been invited by the Lord through his servants. Therefore, the Lord doesn't choose who he invites to his son's feast based on your work. The invitation goes out to everyone. As St. Paul and the Apostle John wrote, God desires all men to be saved. That's why God sent his son to die for the sins of the whole world. Not just for the sins of the elect, or those who think they're good, but for the sins of all of us. You see, that's why we can proclaim boldly that many are called. In fact, we can say to everyone, your sins have been forgiven you in Christ. 
see, the message of salvation through the forgiveness of sins, that a person is justified, declared righteous, and made holy through faith in Christ, that message isn't limited to just a few. It is to go out to the ends of the whole world. It is for us and for our children. It is for our neighbors, friends, and family. That message is for the Jews, for the Muslim, for the Mormon, for the Jehovah's Witnesses, for the Muslim, <coughs> for the atheist. Because that preaching of Christ is the only message that can save anyone. And that message is even for those who mock and see no need to hear God's word or receive the sacrament of the altar, which is the ultimate feast that we participate in even now. And that proclamation of the gospel must be heard by you as well. Because as soon as we stop preaching this way, guess what? We start to forget. And we start to take for granted all that God has done for us. You see, this is the message that must be proclaimed to this sin-filled, dying world in these latter days as we wait for the coming of the Lord. Because again, it is only through the preaching of the gospel that those of us who are dead in our trespasses are made alive again in Christ. But for those who reject and refuse to believe the word of God, even though he has called to them through the preaching of his word, they will not be saved apart from faith. The reason for this is that everything we say and believe has one object, to point us to God and his son and what he has done to save us. You see, that's why any notion of our own good works or decision saving us is an offensive stench in the nostrils of our Lord. Instead of trusting in ourselves, God has given us something else to believe in and cling to. His Son, His Word, His promises. Holy baptism, holy absolution, holy communion. You see, these are the precious gifts of God that He gives to us at His feet. By His invitation <coughs> and by His gracious offering. You see, these are the gifts that the Lord Himself provides to those who would never have come to the banquet if they had not been called by Him and gathered Him in to the preaching of His Word. You see, those who are chosen are the ones who have been given faith to believe these things. We don't have it in us to do this on our own. We don't start out as innocent or as believers. Instead, we start out as enemies of God. Children of wrath and destruction. He calls, gathers, and enlightens us to the preaching of the gospel. And therefore, that's why we must be careful to never put our faith in our faith. Or even in our faithfulness. See, we don't always look to and cling to Christ's faithfulness the way we should. Because it is His faithfulness that saves us. His faithfulness to His Father who called him to come down from heaven above to bear the sins of the world and to offer us salvation through his sacrifice. <coughs> you see, again, we don't know how to believe as we ought. We would go back to the farm, to our business, or to any other place than come here if it were not for Christ and his spirit calling us. You see, we can't even begin to do what is necessary for our salvation. We're damaged goods from the start. As the prophet Isaiah made clear, even our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Just like the garment. No matter how splendid of the man who tried to come to the king's wedding feast dressed in his own clothes. What we bring to the table of salvation is nothing but filth compared to what the Lord gives. You see, because of original sin. Each one of us is born in sin with an inbred desire to sin. That's what we call in God's word confession, concupiscence. And that means that every man, woman, and child who has ever been born with the exception of Jesus himself, who is God's own dear son, is born without fear of God, without trust in God, and with an inclination to disobey God with our thoughts, words, and actions. So, what are we to do if we are worried about our salvation? If this word of the Lord does strike us to the heart? Nothing really that we can do except make sure that you're hearing the gospel. God will continue to work faith in a weak soul through that preaching. And remember that even your
your faith is not your own. It is the gift of God. And that's again why we must gather to hear this word and receive the sacrament. So we might be strengthened as we face the temptations of this flesh and world and the devil and stuff. Because again, your Lord, the reason he sends his servants out to preach to you and to call and gather you and to bring you in even when you would not is because you're weak in your faith and you need his comforting words. That's why we look to the gifts of God that are from outside of us. He will be gladly receive and put on. You see, because you've been given a garment as well. The garment provided by your clothes and your God. And that's why we receive these gifts with thankful hearts. Just as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who <coughs> raised him from the dead, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. You see, in the end, there is no one good at the banquet apart from those who the Lord himself has cleaned up and made good. And you have been made good, having been justified through faith in Christ. And that's God's work. His declaration is changing you into a new creation. And again, that's why baptism is given to us as such a precious gift. We look to the things where God has promised to do His work of saving us. Just as the good and the bad were rounded up and invited to the banquet, we don't come here uninvited of our own accord. Again, just as we believe and confess in the meaning of the third article of the Creed. We see, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to Him. Holy Spirit is called me by the gospel, enlightening with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. faith. That word sanctified means made holy, cleaned up. You see, the Lord has called each one of you. Never here because you made a decision to become a Christian. No one can say Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit first working faith to you in you through the preaching of Christ. And that's how we can say thanks be to God, even when the readings sound harsh. Even when they're full of the law and God's judgment and make us take a hard look into our own hearts and these words that might even frighten us. You see, here is where you find your salvation and your invitation to the banquet and your road of righteousness. Here at the font, in holy baptism, where the Lord's will of righteousness is placed upon you. With God's action has given you what we can never attain for ourselves, a place of peace. The king's own robes. A righteousness that is not ours, for it is Christ's righteousness given to us. And it does become ours, but it doesn't start here. It's placed upon us and in us. And for that we say, Lord, have mercy and thanks be to God. Because we don't deserve this thing. Anyone with faith understands that because of our sins, we should be cast out. And yet, what does the Lord do? He gathers us in. You've been called to the banquet not because of your great deeds, not because of your great faith, but purely for the sake of the Son and all that He has done. Because here, we are the guests. In the divine service, we receive God's gifts. For this is the banquet that we participate in when we hear the gospel preached, and receive the sacraments, the very gifts and treasures of God. You see, Isaiah talked about well-aged, eternal wine. <laughs> and that's Christ's own blood given to us. So do we have reason to rejoice and have confidence this morning? Of course we do. Because we have a place at the Son's wedding feast. Here, every time we hear God's word, every time you remember your baptism in the robe of righteousness, you remember that you have been given a place at His banquet for all eternity. Every time you receive the sacrament of the altar, the Lord gives both the gift and the giver. He gives you the gift. Because God has given you all of these precious gifts as part of his loving kindness to both the good and the bad. We, who are both saint and sinner, that is, 
Those of us who still wrestle against the desires of the flesh, and we lie and we say we know. But these gifts are given to you as the call, the chosen, the saved, and the redeemed of God. And consider this as well. While this text certainly has words of warning and frightening law, the thought of being cast into utter darkness, separated from God, this text is also full of precious gospel. For while God chose to save us while we were yet sinners, and even enemies of God, God the Father chose to punish His own Son by casting him off in our place. Because while the man in the parable had refused God's gift, it was thrown out of the wedding feast on account of his own pride, Christ willingly dies in humility for you. And why? He has to die. Because God cannot allow sin to go unpunished. And the only one capable of bearing our sins is Jesus. Jesus hanging on the cross, his clothes in the filthy rags of your sins and mine and the sins of the whole world even the sins of the unbelievers, as we receive the wedding garment of His righteousness in exchange for our sin. Just as the man was speechless, so was the Son of Man, God's own Son. He didn't utter a word in His defense, but like a lamb to the slaughter, He became sin in our place and suffered a shameful death for us. The Lord turned His face away from I'm, I'm sorry, God the Father turned His face away from His Son, and God the Father poured the wrath that we deserve upon Jesus, who was bound and thrown into the darkness of death for our sakes. And his glorious resurrection from the dead, we too might walk in his eternal light. And so thanks be to God. Even when we hear his words which frighten us and cause us to doubt, we thank him for his word which strengthens our faith as well. For we remember that Jesus suffers for us that we might rejoice with him forever. That's our confidence. Those things that he gives. Just as the prophet Isaiah declared, we this morning are on God's holy mountain. <coughs> Isaiah said, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for his people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. He said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Indeed, those words of the prophet are our words as well. We do rejoice with these words of the Lord because they have been fulfilled for us already as we come to this feast to God with Him. In Jesus' name, Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. You have been watching the divine service at Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Carlisle, Iowa. Join us this coming Sunday at the Divine Service, which begins at 9 a.m. Our Divine Service is followed by Adult Bible Study and Sunday School at 10.30. You're also invited to join us for Vespers and Catechesis for the entire family on Wednesday evenings beginning at 6.30 p.m. We also gather for the morning prayer service of Matins on Thursday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Holy Cross is a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and is located at 1100 Market Street, Carlisle, Iowa.